So in NMR spectroscopy, uh, all nuclei of the same isotope, which experience the same applied field, or B0, resonate at an identical frequency. So you might think that this wouldn't give you very much information about the molecule. All it would tell you is that your molecule has that nucleus in it, because you'd get a single peak at the resonance frequency. The key word in this statement is experiencing. So if we look at the applied field and we have our nucleus in the middle of it, we often forget that the nucleus is surrounded by electrons. Now, electrons have their own tiny magnetic fields, and these actually oppose B0. And it's that as the effect of shielding the nucleus from the applied field. So the magnetic field that the nucleus actually experiences is weaker than B0, and that's dependent upon the electron density around the nucleus. So if B0 is lower at the nucleus, this lowers the resonance frequency in line with the equation shown above. So if we have a nucleus which has low electron density around it, the nucleus experiences more of B0, and if we have a nucleus which has high electron density, it experiences less of B0. As a result, the low electron density nucleus resonates at a higher frequency, whereas the high electron density one resonates at a lower frequency, and this is what we call colloquially deshielding and shielding. So what impact does this have on our actual NMR spectrum? Well, a deshielded nucleus will generally appear at higher frequency or higher ppm, so further to the left of our NMR spectrum, whereas a more shielded nucleus will appear further to the right or at lower ppm. So a signal from the deshielded nucleus might be up here, whereas the shielded nucleus might be down here. But we're talking about resonating at different frequencies, whereas the units of, of an NMR spectrum are always in ppm, or chemical shift. So where does this actually come from? Well, the magnetic field strength of different spectrometers is different, uh, and this is often expressed in terms of the machine's megahertz rating. So you can see this printed on the side of the machine. So this is a 300 megahertz spectrometer, this is a 400 megahertz spectrometer, and this is an 850 megahertz spectrometer. And all that's referring to is the resonance frequency of a hydrogen nucleus placed in this machine will resonate at 850 megahertz, whereas in this machine it'll resonate at 300 megahertz. Now, the reason that that's the case is because these machines have increasingly large magnets inside them. So the magnet in an 850 a uh, megahertz spectrometer will be much larger than that one in, in a 300 megahertz spectrometer. But the upshot of increasing the magnetic field strength is that you change the resonance frequency. So if you increase B0, you increase the resonance frequency. So the same nucleus from the same sample will resonate at different frequencies in all of these spectrometers. And that causes a serious problem because you then can't compare spectra between spectrometers. So a spectrum from an 850 megahertz spectrometer would have a signal at 850 megahertz, whereas a signal from a 300 megahertz spectrometer would have a signal at 300 megahertz. So you can't actually compare the two. So to get around this, we use the idea of chemical shift. Um, and this is the, the frequency of the sample minus the reference frequency, all divided by the reference, gives you the chemical shift. So the units of this uh, are ppm, and this comes from the fact that you're dividing a number in hertz by a number in megahertz, so you're dividing by a million, so it's parts per million here. And the reference standard for all uh, NMR spectrometry is te tetramethylsilane, uh, and this is defined as having a chemical shift of zero. So, as an example, we're running a spectrum on a 600 megahertz instrument, we detect a signal, from a resonance at 600 million 2104 hertz, what's the chemical shift? Well, we feed it into this equation. So 600 million 2104 minus the reference um, frequency, which is the megahertz rating of the instrument, which is 600 million or 600 megahertz. And the number that we get at the end is 3.51 parts per million. If we run the same sample on a 400 megahertz instrument, we'll detect a signal, signal at 400 million 1,405 hertz. We feed the same numbers into the equation, and we come out with the same answer, 3.51 ppm. So it doesn't matter if we record this spectrum on a 600 megahertz instrument or a 400 megahertz instrument. The values that come out at the end in chemical shift are the same. So therefore, we can compare our two spectra now. 
So the three key factors that are affecting electron density and whether or not our nuclei are shielded or deshielded. First of all, inductive effects. Um, this is to do with um, pulling electron density through sigma bonds uh, from electronegative or electropositive atoms. So if we're looking at the hydrogen in purple, um, and we compare these two molecules, one of which has a fluorine substituent, one of which is a lithium substituent. We look at our pooling electronegativity scale. We can see that lithium is a highly electropositive element. Uh, it has an electronegativity rating of 0.98. Um, and if we look at fluorine down here, fluorine is the most electronegative element at 3.98. So what's going to happen here is that fluorine is, because it's highly electronegative, going to pull electron density through the carbon-fluorine bond and as a result through the carbon-hydrogen bond. And this is going to have the effect of deshielding that nucleus, pulling electron density away from that hydrogen and moving it to higher ppm. On the other hand, lithium is highly electropositive. It doesn't really care about having electrons. It would rather give them to something else. So as a result, lithium is going to push its electron density back through the carbon-lithium bond and back through the carbon-hydrogen bond and shield hydrogen relative to what it would have been normally. So H is said to be shielded by inductive effect and as a result has a lower chemical shift. So the signal for this proton up here will appear to the left hand side of the spectrum, higher ppm, and the signal for this proton over here will appear to the right side of the spectrum at lower ppm. So here are some examples. Um, we said earlier that tetramethylsilane is the, 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 the standard and it's set by definition as zero. Uh, if we move to a more electropositive uh, element than silicon, we can see that we've dropped into minus uh, numbers in our PPM, in our chemical shift, and that's because lithium is forcing electron density back onto these hydrogens and shielding them relative to what silicon was doing. Um, if we start to look at electronegative elements, we can see that the effect is reasonably additive. So these hydrogens over here are being deshielded by fluorine. Uh, if we have two fluorines on that atom, then we have uh, more of an inductive effect, so the chemical shift increases up to 5.45, and three fluorine atoms will increase even more to 6.41. Uh, if we compare fluorine with less electronegative elements, uh, such as nitrogen, oxygen, chlorine or iodine, we can see that the chemical shifts aren't as high uh, and that's due to the, the lowered inductive effect of these, these elements because they're not as electronegative as fluorine. So the second key factor that affects shielding and deshielding uh, is conjugation or resonance. So if we look at these two molecules side by side, over here we have methyl vinyl ether uh, and we're comparing it with a standard alkene, in this case ethene. Now we can see that the alkene uh, hydrogens resonate at 5.3 ppm. Um, but in the case of methyl vinyl ether, uh, this, this proton here is relatively deshielded compared to that at 6.4 ppm, and these protons down here are relatively shielded at around 4 ppm. So what's going on here? Well, if we draw the resonance form for methyl vinyl ether, we can push in the lone pair of electrons from oxygen into this pi system. And that gives us a resonance form where we've got a formal negative charge on carbon down here, uh, which is having a shielding effect on these two protons. So we're pushing electron density onto them, and that's effectively shielding them from B0. So they're resonating at a lower ppm. If we switch now to methyl crotonate, we've changed from something which is in which is conjugatively electron donating to something which is conjugatively electron withdrawing. So if we draw the resonance form of this, we're actually pulling electrons out of the carbon-carbon uh, -carbon double bond. And the resonance form of this then therefore puts a formal positive charge uh, on this carbon down here. And that's had the effect of deshielding this proton down here uh, relative to, to ethene. So carbonyl, nitro, and nitro groups can all withdraw electrons um, using resonance forms. So you can all draw resonance forms for these which um, pull electron density away from these carbon atoms here. And you can see that relative to a, a normal alkene, these are all comparatively deshielded. Uh, but they're also electron withdrawing by induction. Uh, the effect is, is slightly less profound. But if you compare uh, an alkyl proton here, just by situating a carbonyl next door, you get an inductive effect which 
withdraws electron density from these uh, protons. As a result, they resonate at a higher ppm. But if we look at a system which is based purely on induction, so we've now got a difluoride here, um, which is very strongly inductively electron withdrawing, we see that actually the difference in chemical shift is only 0 0.3 in moving from an unsubstituted system to a purely electron withdrawing by induction system. So there must be something else happening in a carbonyl, a nitrile and a nitro group which is making these uh, differences in chemical shift uh, much higher. And this is the third key factor that affects shielding and deshielding, um, and it's called magnetic anisotropy. So when pi systems such as carbonyls, carbon-carbon double bonds and so on, are exposed to B0, uh, we get this magnetic anisotropy effect. And all it means is there are unequal regions of the magnetic field. So the classic example is benzene rings. Uh, and if we look at a benzene ring side on, we can see that there are electron clouds above and below the plane of the ring. So if we look at this um, within B0, what this does is generates what we call a ring current in the, um, in the electron clouds, uh, which flows around in a circle like this. So the anisotropy occurs because the ring current reinforces B0 in some areas, such as over here. You can see that the arrows are moving in the same direction as B0 along the z-axis. And it opposes B0 in other areas, so such as down here and above here, you can see that the magnetic moment is moving in the opposite direction. So we have areas of reinforcement and we have areas of opposition. Now, any nuclei which are sitting in the reinforced areas are experiencing an, an artificially stronger field. Uh, and as a result, they are effectively deshielded. So because the ring current is reinforcing the magnetic field, that's making B0 effectively higher, um, and the nuclei are deshielded as a result, so they will appear at higher ppm. Uh, and this is the reason that protons that are attached to a benzene ring are higher in ppm than those on an alkyl chain, because they're sitting in this area of what we call paramagnetic deshielding. Nuclei which are sitting in the opposed areas experience a weaker field and are effectively shielded. But because this is above and below the benzene ring, it's very rare that nuclei actually uh, appear in this range. You would have to have quite a strangely shaped molecule to, to hold a, a nucleus above or below a benzene ring. So magnetic anisotropy works for the same for isolated double bonds. Uh, so it works for carbon-carbon double bonds uh, and carbonyls, and you end up with these areas of opposition and reinforcement. And that has the effect of effectively deshielding anything else that's around it, because all of your substituents are going to be in that plane um, of reinforcement. So paramagnetic deshielding is very common. Um, as I said, it explains why protons attached to aromatic rings tend to resonate at, at higher ppm than those in alkyl chains. It also explains why alkenes are reasonably high uh, in ppm. And it also explains why aldehydes are exceptionally high ppm because they're being uh, heavily deshielded by the fact that they're directly attached to a carbonyl, which is bringing about this magnetic anisotropy. So in addition to these atoms which are directly attached, um, you can think of it as sort of a spillover effect. So if we look at uh, a, a standard al alkyl um, proton environment at about 1.3 ppm, we're getting a spillover of the magnetic anisotropy from this carbonyl, um, which is effectively deshielding this proton next to it. And this uh, basically explains why the differences in, in, um, in ppm for these systems that have got pi bonds are much higher than those that are purely based on induction, like the alkyl fluorides that we saw before. So just as a, a brief sort of overview, deshielded nuclei have lower electron density around the nucleus, resonate at a higher frequency because they're experiencing a stronger B0. Um, this is often called downfield or low field, this end of the spectrum. Uh, but fundamentally, it's a higher chemical shift. Uh, shielded nuclei have increased electron density around the nucleus and as a result have all of the opposite traits of deshielded nuclei.